Hello, everyone, and welcome to the spoilers review of Black Mirror Season 3. I'm so excited to do this. My name is Clark Wolf. I am the host of Collider Nightmares, and we have an incredible panel of people here ready to talk Black Mirror. I think you guys have all been talking about this, right? I've been seeing it all over the, the internet. So let's get right down to it. To my left, we have Miss Perry Nemiroff. I am about ready to explode right now. I don't know how we kept it to just like a few minutes on Nightmares. I'm so happy we have the spoilers review right now. It's very exciting. Yes, for, for those of you who haven't watched Collider Nightmares yet, in addition to other TV happenings that happened this week, and boy, there were a lot of them, just we, uh, we, we dipped our toe into the waters that is Black Mirror season three and to Perry's left we have Mr. David Griffin hello sir hello I'm so glad I get to collaborate <laughs> with the Collider Nightmares crew I've never been able to do this before this is nice for a change it and is and also too same thing on TV talk we only had a few minutes I mean with Walking Dead Westworld the superhero shows it's just too much to watch so I'm glad we could do a deep dive as well yeah I'm it's excited. a great time for TV and uh, so let's go ahead and get right down to it now for those of you who don't know Black Mirror is a series that started in the UK uh, it became I would say it became sort of an international phenomenon once it's found its way onto Netflix. Um, mm. At least I know that's when I first started hearing about it a couple of Christmases ago, everybody losing their mind mm -hmm. because Black Mirror had made its way onto Netflix. And so Netflix teamed up with showrunner and series creator Charlie Brooker to bring us um, 12 new episodes. Now we only got the first six in this batch, but boy, these six were fantastic. And for those of you who aren't uh, aware, Black Mirror is an anthology series, uh, but it's not an anthology series in the way that American Horror Story is per season. So each episode is completely contained. It's its own thing. Um, so so uh, that's important to know. So we're going to make our way through all six of the new episodes right now. And we're going to start with Nosedive. So this was episode one of the season directed by Joe Wright. And it was written by Rashida Jones and uh, Michael Schur. So guys, I don't know, this might be my favorite episode of this season. I know that's a bold statement to make because this was a great season. But um, how about you guys, to kick off season three, you know, this is a new thing for Netflix. Obviously, the order matters. We have Nosedive starring Bryce Dallas Howard and Alice Eve. Do you guys think this was a good place to start? This is an excellent place to start because who out there, you, if you're watching this review right now, you probably use social media. You probably like people's stuff. You probably, you know, use all those new Facebook reactions. When you think about that and how you use your phone and your computer at this point and then watch this episode, even though we don't use it the same way as the characters do here, it's still, I mean, immediately after watching Nosedive, I go online and I'm scrolling through my Instagram and I'm liking people's stuff and I'm almost picturing them reacting like Bryce Dallas Howard. And that's, pretty freaking disturbing it's terrifying <laughs> i mean to be especially in this reality where you're constantly judged we're all constantly judged in some way but i mean digitally instant you know mm -hmm. we're receiving something instantly about like a five-star rating it's like i would hold up my phone to you and be like hi perry how are you doing today you look great Doo -doo -doo. of course i would always say that about perry but i mean it's just in this world it's like you're constantly judging that it decides what kind of house you're gonna get what kind of job you're gonna live or job you're gonna have and i think unless you're like her brother who seemed like he was content with playing video games with his friends and he was like a three something, you know, he seemed kind of real. He was like, hey, look, this is my life. At least I'm honest about it. She was trying to put on airs to be accepted. And that's terrifying. It's, it's hard enough for, especially like, hey, we're here on camera right now being judged right now. Like you imagine instantly getting that back all the time, that feedback. And the extra layer <clears throat> to that though, is like, even though he's content with not playing by right. the rating system in this world, within this episode, what you can do in life is restricted by your rating. Yeah. And, you know, not, not to give comments on the internet so much validity but there are situations where if if so and so is just i don't know even panned as a writer a sure. director an actor anything they might not get work later on so this isn't so far out of the realm of possibility well here. and in our industry in the entertainment industry but in other industries as well you know social media following is currency there mm -hmm. are plenty of jobs that uh, people do not get or do get or are helped to get because they have X amount of followers mm -hmm. or X amount of interactions. Those things actually matter. And um, it reminded me too, you know, obviously the, the direct parallel is an Uber or Lyft where not only are you rating and reviewing uh, the, the service that you were given, but you are also being rated and reviewed as a passenger. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting. And, and I was uh, doing some reading and I think the easy criticism of this episode is, well, they're so superficial 
special that they ultimately just get what they deserve because they can't stand on their own. But I really felt for both, well, not really for Alice Eve's character, but I absolutely felt for, felt for Bryce Dallas Howard's mm-hmm. character. I, I empathized with her and I thought, you know, I, I really, it, because of all those things that you guys just mentioned, that you can't get a house, your job depends on it. Like, that stuff really matters. Um, so I, I found this to be a very compelling episode. It's also a beautifully shot episode. It's really, I mean, the color, her performance, just like the style of her performance and what she made that character paired with that pastel mm. look, it really does go the extra length. And that's something that's present throughout this entire series. Every single episode is so appropriately shot for the tone of the episode and the same with the score as well. Everything I think was totally on point here. We have to keep in mind too, Charlie Brooker comes from a comedic background. I was listening to a really good interview with him on NPR and he was saying that when he's writing these episodes, even though some of them seem kind of dark and twisted, he's laughing most of the time. He really has this kind of dark sense of humor. So I, I found myself laughing and also being really scared just because I felt bad for the guy outside mm-hmm. the coffee shop. Like, I just need a few points. I want to get a cup of coffee. You know, know, you can't get a cup of coffee. What happens to him if his number goes <laughs> yeah. below, you know? I mean, what you become this... that truck driver, exactly. like the lady. Oh, I loved Great her. Character. Yeah. She was so good. Mm-hmm. She's also on Transparent right now. Oh, like, okay. she's, she's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, any final thoughts on that one? I think I'm so glad you mentioned the way it looked too because I thought the production design on this episode mm-hmm. was was stunning. I mean, it just, it looked like it was out of a drawing almost. Um, I thought it was really impressive. And Rashida Jones and her writing partner, Michael, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. like so cool. I mean, Charlie Brooker, it, you know, came up with the story, but they're the ones that actually wrote the episode. And I, I thought that was pretty neat. I think this whole series is helped by the fact that even though it's, it's his voice that we're hearing most of the time, that he lets all these different directors like Joe Wright. I mean, he directed, mm-hmm. you know, Pride and Prejudice with Karen Knightley and sure. um, Atonement. Atonement, which is fantastic. So, I mean, I'm glad that he outsources this to other people too. It's nice. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on into the next episode, Playlist. Now, this was directed by 10 Cloverfield Lane director Dan Trachtenberg. It was written by Charlie Brooker himself and stars Wyatt Russell in, um, you know, what a good breakout performance for him. Obviously, we've seen him uh, before in 22 Jump Street and uh, everybody wants some. Um, um, but you know, this was this was a different turn for him, and I thought he really pulled it off. This was fantastic. This was so. After watching all the episodes, I stressed myself out. Even I was so upset that I had no more to watch, and I'm like, I'll just make it even worse and rub it in and force myself to rank them all. This was my number three, just above Nosedive. And when I say rank, I, I brought this up on Nightmares. I want to say every single episode is a nine or above, with my favorite being like an eleven. This episode, though, I was really all for it. This, to me, was a fun play on technology and also had that really great haunted house vibe that I think they played with really well. And I brought this up a little on Nightmares, too, because this was one of my favorites. But Wyatt Russell in this, you need a performance like this to Mm -hmm. sell this whole concept because it's all about how he starts out being, you know... So, like obviously he's got problems but he's mostly like a fun loving playful kind of guy and just watching that get completely stripped away mm-hmm. knowing that that was his personality and he's kind of like oh I'm going to be fine in this house and to see him just like a pure terror on his face and then what happens to him in the end it's mortifying I think that's the scariest thing more than even like being in like a real haunted house is being trapped inside your mind mm-hmm. and Brooker loves playing with that I mean we could see that in the White Christmas episode uh, with John Hamm again like the prison inside your mind I mean that's the scariest oh. thing because your mind is what creates all these horrors you know the the fear um, which hopefully keeps us safe but when you're trapped in there it looks like for him for what point zero four seconds that's all it took and then he's gone like that and plus I'm a video gamer mm-hmm. so that also scares me too because we have VR and all this stuff going Dan Trachtenberg before he did 10th Lord Field Lane did this really good short film on, or a little like short film on uh, Portal the video game oh, yeah, which yeah. is kind of what's got him his deal for doing the directing he's doing now so it's cool that he went back to talking about a uh, video game well and I think too <clears> you know I, I'm not a gamer but I have been reading the reactions online and a lot of people who do game kind of feel like we're not that far away from this type of really intense simulated reality and really believe the simulated mm-hmm. reality, which is, unfortunately for me, I mean, I don't play video games, so I, I didn't, I felt a little bit more removed, but I think everybody can identify with a haunted house scenario, and I loved that this was Black Mirror's take on a traditional haunted house scenario. He was the only person to direct this, too, because it reminded me a little of 10 Cloverfield Lane, mm-hmm. just the, the confinement of that house and the way he shoots it, where, you know, you really get a good sense.
sense of the geography of that house and the, the production design in there is absolutely stunning. It's like I can still picture what the outside of the house in particular looks like, which was, you know, from the game within mm -hmm. the episode. I really like that touch as well. And really all the supporting performances too. I forget the I forget the young woman now who who plays his uh, his love interest in the episode, but mm -hmm. That's a good example of a performance in these episodes where, you know, it's not the main performance, it's a supporting performance, but it's something that is is referenced enough where it adds to that, you know, the mine F scenario sure. where you don't really know what her role is in the episode. And I just constantly found myself wondering, like, oh, is she involved more so than I even anticipate? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they kind of tease it and then they pull it back. Mm -hmm. And I, I still, even after that part was over, I still was wondering, is she going to pop back up? So it's nice to see a performance on that level have that lasting effect. Love that shot with the painting. That was like my, one of my favorite scenes. That was scenes. one of mine too. Got the guy in the window, light on, light on. Yeah. And also too, just just call your mom. Talk to her. If your mom calls, yeah. answer the phone. What a call great, her, what a mom. great little <laughs> what a great little button too. Um the actress who played Sonia is Hannah John Sonia, Kamen. Um and yeah, I, I loved, you know, I was reading this interview in Entertainment Weekly with Charlie Brooker where where they talked about putting that button on the end of, you know, call mother called his mother or mm -hmm. mother whatever it was. And I was just like that is so, like you were saying, the dark comedy of it. You know, it's it, it's such a horrible thing getting zipped up in a body bag, and then you know, and then just that little little end on yeah. the end. Oh. Loved it. All right, so let's move on to shut up and dance. Now, this one uh, I think is arguably the most dark of the season so far. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I suppose it depends on on your personal taste, but this one for me. Uh, was really upsetting, emotionally yeah. upsetting, and was dealing with some really heavy stuff. So this one was directed by James Watkins, and it was written by Charlie Brooker. And the premise, if you've seen it, is basically that a young boy um, gets caught on camera doing something that I'd say most young boys have done in their life. Uh, but he's horrified that this video will circulate. And um, and then he goes on this, this um, you know, he's being directed by this mysterious person texting him. And, you know, the whole time we're sitting here kind of, I don't know about you guys, but I was sort of going, okay, well, I mean, yeah, if that video got out, it would be mortifying. Of course it would be embarrassing, mm -hmm. but boy, he's, he's robbing a bank. He's like, you know, breaking into people's places. And then we come to find out in the end that boy, everybody involved in this is is not a good person. Ugh, he's a tough yeah. kid. I was, was surprised he won that he fight. At the, I was like, there's no way this guy can be. This guy's a little bigger than he was. He, he's a tough kid, but then it's reminded me, I think it was season two, remember the episode White Bear? With the woman who um, was in the uh, was like an amusement park for criminals. Oh Remember yeah. Remember yeah. she like woke mm -hmm. up and like and again he makes you kind of feel for the criminal. You don't know what she did until the very end. Just like with this kid, you find out that you know he's probably looking at little kitty pictures or whatever, and it's horrible. And you're like, wow, okay, now I don't feel bad for him, but like you still kind of like this is still like an awful experience. Like he he, he plays with you like that. You think you want to hate that person, like you kind of you don't. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, like, it it was hard not <clears throat> to feel for him, and that was one heck. I wrote mm -hmm. his name down thankfully, but that was one heck. A performance from Al. I'll probably pronounce it wrong. Alex Lothar. Yeah, he was good. Oh my god, he's very good. He he is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's just you know a literal version of shaking in your boots the entire the entire episode. You could see him trembling from mm -hmm. start to finish, and you know I feel like most uh, I hate saying this, but most like mainstream shows and movies right. would have would have had the kid kind of you know suck it up and go into the bank and just do his deal. I mean to see to see his performance and what he looks like when he's just absolutely trembling in there every mm -hmm. stage of the process and just really this is another example of great supporting performances too where every single person in this in this game in this test whatever we're going to call it you I, I remember what everybody was guilty of mm -hmm. what they could lose and just to know the network of people that could have been involved and how many lives could be ruined by something like this yet at the same time what they all did was so terrible again you know another typical uh you know mind melding situation where you don't know how to feel about any of these characters you kind of feel yourself playing judge jury and executioner mm -hmm. on these episodes because for me like when i was thinking about the punishments in the end i'm like okay child porn really bad one guy died it's like I don't know if I feel that bad in the terms in terms of a TV mm -hmm. show context. And then Jeremy Flynn cheated, bad, not a good guy, 
doesn't deserve to die though probably you know maybe deserves to lose his family doesn't deserve to die like those kind of, you kind of feel yourself playing that i'm like yeah i think this is justified but you know it's more it makes you think about those things it goes back to <clears throat> to nosedive and i think the mm -hmm. same kind of predicament comes up in uh the last episode as well where yeah. it's you know you know why these things are bad and maybe certain people should be punished for their actions but at the same time yeah. You know, it's it's human beings we're talking about, right. and there is crossing the line. Right. Right. Yeah, and I think this is an episode too where to go back to the, your point about casting. I think casting was such an important part of this mm -hmm. episode because, you know, obviously we learn what this kid uh, Kenny has done, but the casting of Alex Lothar, you know, he looks so young, he looks so innocent that there was part of me that didn't even when the reveal happened, I didn't believe it. Like I kind of was like, wait, am I hearing this wrong? There's no way that that person there's no way that that sweet poor kid mm -hmm. could have done this mm. horrible thing and I think that that's something really cool about Black Mirror is that you know they they really when they are casting these roles they're very aware of what you're going to uh, automatically assume about a character based on how they look also got to give credit to to uh, Jerome Flynn he from Game great. of Thrones Bron. One of my favorite Fine. Game of Thrones people. He's such a good actor. And I think, too, again, playing with those things. I remember the beginning when the kid, I think the little girl drops her toy, you know, and then he acts really affectionate towards her and gives the toy. And then, of course, when you get to the end, you think back on that. It's like, ooh. Most you know, it's of like, these oh. episodes do have that rewatchability oh, yeah. quality yeah. because mm -hmm. most Black Mirror episodes come with some sort of twist at the end, and it really just adds a whole other layer to the experience when you go back and watch it from the beginning, right. w knowing where this all ends up and what the situation really is. Sure. Okay, so next up, episode four of the third season, mm -hmm. San Junipero. Now, this one has been the one that I have been reading the most about. Um, I think this is collectively the internet's favorite episode, but not. it doesn't have to be our favorite episode, <laughs> but it was beautiful, and I think it was meaningful. And um, so what, what were your reactions to this one? This my is number my favorite. Two. This was your favorite? This is my favorite. Oh. I, I like a love story. I feel like we it's should totally story. be doing rankings at the end. Not to put everyone on the spot <laughs> yeah, here. No, I don't mind. No, I don't, this was I my don't favorite. do rankings. I just didn't. I wasn't sure what we were starting. I'm like, okay, what are we doing? We're in the '70s here. Everybody's dancing in the disco. I'm like, what's going on here? And then it just kind of slowly builds and builds. And uh, Gugu and Batha Raw. I've always loved her. She's in that movie uh, mm. Bell that came out She's a few so years good. ago. She's good. And as in a Mackenzie Davis did a fantastic job as well. Um, I, it's a story that kind of has a happy ending, but I kind of think I'm like, is it happy? Do I want to be trapped in this digital afterlife? I mean, it's weird. It's like, is this good or not good? Do I want to be stuck in San Junipero for the rest of my life? I don't know. It's, again, I love these episodes because they leave you questioning if you were in this existence, mm -hmm. would you want to just have your life, well, I guess it depends on what you believe in, but would you have your life just end? Or would you want to be uploaded into this virtual cloud? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I don't that, that's <clears> why this episode reminded me of Be Right Back from uh, from season, see, <laughs> we run over this earlier, season two, episode mm -hmm. one with Haley Atwell. Oh, right. Where it's like, mm -hmm. would you do that yep. if you lost a loved one? And yep. here it's like, if your life is ending and you could live on forever with someone that you truly love, would mm -hmm. you do it? Knowing that your, your other family has passed on beyond this realm. In the end, I kind of just, took it as this was a happy ending for them yeah. also because they have the out where That's you, you, can't you, could, end it. Yeah. you could leave San Junipero if you want but what a nice relationship piece where it just shows these these two, and especially uh, Mackenzie Davis's character too where she really evolves over the mm. course of this episode where in the beginning she's new to this and she has no clue and then by the end this is home to her and I believe that I believed her decision to want to be there and to, to be together. Yeah, I think that's what I was going to say is I think that you really get to experience a journey in this right. episode, you know, as opposed to like a self-contained tale. In one hour, we have experienced a lifetime with these people and, mm -hmm. and the, their love and I thought that that was really powerful and we have to talk about the music in this episode mm -hmm. as well. I mean, so many great songs uh, from each decade, lots of 80s stuff that's coming up and then of course stuff from the 90s in the mm -hmm. 2000s and um, Clint Mansell uh, did the score for this episode and it's just I mean the music is absolutely brilliant in this episode the and music it helps and the production that, design yeah yeah some nice fun touches they're all working together to really tell the story completely it's it's a great it's a great um, it's almost like a short film in a way I but. feel like this could have been a little longer I could have yeah. I could have saved this world a little bit longer 
This wasn't the longest episode, the final mm-hmm. episode that we're going to talk about. That was the longest one. I thought this could have been maybe an hour and 20. Yeah. I would have been fine with that. But I could have definitely done like an Eternal Sunshine like <laughs> length, you know, like mm-hmm. a real feature film based on this idea. Well, I feel think- like that's the case with all of these ideas. Yeah. Except maybe Nosedive. I think Nosedive yeah. was very well suited to uh, the 60 minute format. Mm-hmm. But everything else, I think I would have been open to a feature version of everything. The only thing I think about just because, look, this is the future. It's like, are there options? Like, is it just Andrew DePero? Or like, is it going to be like an upgrade? You know, it's going to be like an 8.1 that comes out. Be like, hey, we can do Malibu. Or you can do the Alps. Or you can do like different things. (laughs) Touring the world. Yeah, touring the world. In your afterlife. Um, Okay, let's move on to the next one. Men Against Fire. The director was Jacob uh, Verbruggen. And the writer was Charlie Brooker. Um, This one, this one was... this one was pretty serious um, mm-hmm. and and had a great messaging, too. I think that that's, you know, there, uh, what I love about Black Mirror so much as a series is just that most of the time there's really an underlying point or message. And I think this one this one was very relevant and important. But what were your thoughts on this one? Because it was definitely like unpleasant. Yeah. I feel like this and Shut Up and Dance were the two most unple- le- least enjoyable, but not mm-hmm. that's obviously not a knock against the show. They're not supposed to enjoy these really these two in particular like hard, um, difficult stories. Yeah, I would say that. And this was probably, I mean, nothing is traditional about any of these episodes, but this this felt more familiar to me than anything, just because it does have the zombie element. This was probably my least favorite of the season, but again, it's not because it was a bad episode. Every single one of these episodes is absolutely Mm. excellent. Something about it, you know, even though this is a very timely topic and, you know, there is meaning to what is revealed at the end, there was something about it that I personally could not connect to as well as some of the other episodes, but I still, I still thought it was like absolutely exhilarating and just... You know, again, let's bring it back. I, I wish I could say the F word on this show because I would say the mine F word six times over here. Mm. That element of it and the actor who play who played the lead character, I thought was was excellent yet again. And uh, yeah, Malachi Kirby. Oh God, what's her name? name? The one who play, plays the blonde one now. She's from oh, Hemlock, Madeline Brewer. Hemlock Grove and Orange is the New Black. Mm. It's nice to see her in something else. And I think she she was again. Actually, this goes back to what you said about casting someone in a role that you would think go one way like right. she's like a little mm-hmm. tiny blonde girl you would think she wouldn't be some like big you know hulking soldier type who can shoot anything and isn't scared of anything but she plays into that role pretty damn well I guess it again I, maybe with you Perry it didn't connect with me as much as the other episodes but I, I got its point it's interesting though I kind of disagree with Michael Kelly's character from the guy from House of Cards mm-hmm. you know great character actor and he's, he's a psychiatrist and he's talking to the guy and he says, you know, humans, we don't re- we're don't we more empathetic than people think. We don't really want to kill each other. And I'm like, we don't need to have an alternate reality to see that humanity is rough. Like we are killing each other. And I don't think we need to change the faces of people to make it easier to kill. I mean, our militaries do a good enough job desensitizing our guys so they can do what they have to do, which is horrific. But sometimes I guess they have to do what they have to do. And I don't think... Like I saw it as an alternate reality, but I'm like, I don't think we need we needed this point of view. I feel like our worlds are we, this is already happening without mind altering drugs that mm-hmm. show us a different like a zombie face, so it makes it easier to kill. Mm-hmm. I don't think we need that drug, which is scary in and of itself. This world's already terrifying enough in some ways. So I guess for me, I just didn't quite uh, connect with this episode as much. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a different form of conditioning, like you were alluding to, where every military around the world mm-hmm. has to do some form of conditioning in order to allow their soldiers to take a life if necessary, and so. So it, the alternate reality of, of distortion, you know, like that's their version of conditioning. But this was, I mean, look, this was an unpleasant episode. I think I think that that's really fair to say. And I I don't think that it's a surprise that perhaps maybe we, we connected to it a little bit less because I think when you look at the rest of them, for the most part, there's there's something, you know, it's not social media or it's not a video game. Like this is, this is war. And, um, but I do think the way that they shot it in that sort of first person shooter kind of video game style mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. really clever and cool. What do you think of Malachi Kirby's character, Stripe, in his relationship, or at least his visions or his dreams, like, I'm going to give you a good dream tonight, which seemed to go wrong. Um, what Was that his girl at one point, do you think? Is that actually, you think she was a real person that he's visioning or something that they've created for him? Um, or is she somebody real from his life? Because he doesn't seem like he remembers even committing to the program until mm-hmm. he showed him that video. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I lean towards that person being a real person in his life, mm-hmm. but then again, there there is that point in the episode when he threatens to wipe his memory clean. So yeah. I, I think this is a situation where we kind of can't 
completely trust anything that we right. Say. Like I almost wonder if that's like if she was even though I know he goes to that house at the end and mm-hmm. looks at that and he sees her in the window. I almost wonder if that's like the reason that he keeps fighting mm-hmm. is her. You know, but she might not even exist, which is again scary. Yeah, <laughs> another example of like a great performance with no dialogue. Yeah. With not no dialogue, but he had very minimal dialogue, mm-hmm. and most of what I got from the episode is just purely from his expressions and how he behaved out in right. the field. So, mm-hmm. yet another example of stellar casting. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to before we move on to Hated in the Nation, which is the final episode and the longest one of this season. I wanted to mention that one of the things that I love so much, love so much about Black Mirror, even before it went to Netflix, was these actors. You know, the, the actors that they found for this show always looked like real people. They had mm-hmm. different backgrounds. They, you know, they, there was, there was not just one, they didn't look like actors. They didn't look like pretty clean, you know, like perfect people. And I think in a lot of ways, that's why we were able to identify with them is because they look like real folks. And, um, and I was very glad that with a couple of exceptions, obviously there are some big names in this, in this season's cast. I really thought that the casting this season maintained Maintained that original flavor of the first couple of seasons. It doesn't use the casting as a crutch. Right. Yeah. They just hire the people they need to fill the roles and they do a good job. Because remember, like when the first one came out, I mean, Haley Atwell wasn't big at that, right. at that point. Uh, D- Donald Gleason wasn't yeah. popular at that point. I mean, now we see him like, oh, he's in Star Wars. But I mean, it's cool that they find those actors so young. And, and even the John Hamm episode, though. Yeah. I mean, like he's really big and famous, mm-hmm. but that's not why I love the episode or was drawn to that episode. He he completely, to me, loses himself in that character. Yeah. He's, he's so good. Okay, that's, that still terrifies me. I don't want to yeah. be blocked. Don't I block. Know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. And finally, we have Hated in the Nation, mm-hmm. J- directed by James Hawes and written by Charlie Brooker. Now, this one was the longest episode of the season. It really is runtime of a feature film. I mean, if you're going to, yeah. it's pretty, if it's not right on the nose, it's pretty damn close. Um, so, Perry, this one was your favorite. It was. Do you want to talk a little, start talking a little bit about it? Okay. To, to repeat the things that I've said for multiple episodes that I think are, again, Again, major assets in this one is the mind F element of it, yep. where what is happening is bad. The the bad guy in this is bad, bad, bad. He does terrible things, but at the same time, people use that hashtag and that is awful. And maybe people should learn a lesson from the consequences of this episode. Another episode with absolutely fantastic casting. I was attempting to look up her name because I feel so bad that the the young oh, well, actress who uh, plays the yeah. plays the wave she's just like forever the wave like her name is gone she's just going to be she, the wave for the rest of her life. Faye I think. Faye Mar- yeah, Faye Mar- yeah, thank you. Yeah. But I mean, when I was watching this episode, I took note of her and I'm like, oh, who is that actress? Mm-hmm. And then I looked it up and I'm like, wow, like, it's the same girl, and that is just incredible. I think the all the cast is is awesome in this. This was by far my favorite episode. Probably one because I'm a little terrified of bees in real life. So just the fact that those bees, that, I mean, really, that is a horrifying thing, that those bees and just the way that they could attack and kill someone. One of my favorite scenes in this whole episode was that scene in the in the cottage in the safe house yeah. with, with the young woman that they're trying to save, and they lock themselves in the bathroom, and you could just, you know that it's it's going to go wrong. There is no way they can keep these little bees out. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the thing where every time I tell someone I'm afraid of bees, like, oh, you're much bigger than the bee is. Like, you can just swat it and kill it. Maybe in real life, kind of, but <laughs> but really, just the bee as, as as an insect can get into any little crack or, mm-hmm. or through a vent, and watching them try to save that girl, where you know they're just covering up the door, covering up the keyhole, covering up the the vent, trying to not let this mechanical bee crawl into any hole in her bed. <laughs> it's really, really just awful. I was on the edge of my seat, and this to me is something that is deserving of being played in a theatrical setting this not just because of its runtime just because of the content and what we get this is a movie this is a theatrical experience right here and where it ends i'd kind of want a sequel okay you want to see if uh if if she's gonna get him yeah like i got him yeah it's funny too because that that ending shot where she's chasing Mm -hmm. chasing him it kind of reminded me of game of thrones when she's when she's stalking uh (laughs) yeah a little bit i I love too um the episode it's not just about you know death to trolls uh but it's also about uh government you know uh Mm -hmm. and how much you know they can spy on us because the guy's like look Benedict Wong's character, who's doing an excellent performance in Marco Polo, if you haven't seen that on Netflix, that's where he's kind of been the last few years after Prometheus. Um, when he's doing, uh, you know, his, I guess, talking about the government, it's like, look, we're not just gonna fund a project to help farming. 
You know, and the whole thing with bees, Jim McCuga talked about this on TV Talk yesterday about how we need bees. Remember, this remember is, bee movie? The is, bee movie and the bees were gone. Remember like the roses and everything? Like you need bees, you need pollinization. We need to be able to pollinate. And I thought that was kind of a cool twist too. Like we're going to do that. We're also going to use it to spy on people too. Yeah, I mean, this <clears> is not an accident. This can't be an accident that it's bees. I mean, like every time I say bees, I think of Arrested Development, like bees. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but but I know, I mean, really like guys, this is a serious, serious issue that is a global issue. Bees are dying yeah. and and our this is bad news for our crops and for our livelihood. And so I did love how they made this this animatronic or whatever you want to call it, this creature in bee form, kind mm -hmm. of doing what bees do. And I loved kind of how it's like they almost turned on us, but it's like that's what you get. Don't kill the bees, and then we won't have to <laughs> genetically engineer them, and then they won't turn on us and kill us. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know. Perhaps that's the environmentalist Save the bees. in me. Save the bees is right, y'all. <laughs> Bees, beads. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, I, I thought that it was a really g a great message, and and I do think that it's important to um, address these issues of social media. Like in the premiere episode, Nosedive, we're dealing with the rating and mm -hmm. the liking and the acceptance. But I like how we bookend the season with mm -hmm. the other end of that, which is, you know, the vitriol and the mm -hmm. anger and the hatred that is able to be um, communicated through social media and this horrid mentality, yeah. um, which is very serious. Yeah. I mean, I, if you've experienced it, it, it's unpleasant and people's lives get ruined over these kinds of things. It's very easy to forget that just clicking a like or writing a not so nice comment can really, I uh, truly have consequences. And, wh and what was the, the manifesto called in this it was something of consequences oh, yeah. but mm -hmm. Yeah, it just goes to show. Well, that's the thing with trolling. I mean, the reason why there's so much of it is because you can sit in your house or wherever you are at a coffee shop and pretty much not be identified and tweet something. So, of course, this is the horrific version of that where somebody finds a way to track you and then get you with bees. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> bees. That bore through your brain and yeah. kill you. Yeah. That's a horrible oh. way to go. This is another uh, great example of an excellent score in another Black Mirror episode. The whole mm -hmm. thing is fantastic, but the one point where where I stopped and noted is when they're driving to the safe house. I don't know. I can't explain, articulate what the score is like and why it struck me, but if you scroll back to that part of the episode, it's fantastic. Well, guys, that's it. We blew through 35 minutes like you oh, wouldn't God. believe. But I'm so happy that we got a chance to go even little by little uh, over these last six episodes. And there are going to be six more coming to Netflix, we think, in 2017. So we'll definitely stay tuned for that. But I want to say thank you to the panel. Perry, where can everybody find you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, best of the week, every Saturday. And on the Walking Dead recap show and after Ash, our Ash vs. Evil Dead recap show every Sunday night as well. Okay, and David? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at GriffinDE, as well as every Saturday with Christian Harloff and John Campia reviewing Star Wars Rebels. We're taking a break this week because there's no new episode, but check out uh, check back next week and also every Monday right here on Collider TV Talk. Fabulous. And you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E on the internet and on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you enjoyed this conversation, if you like Black Mirror, check us out. You'll probably like us too. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to watch uh, Collider Movie Talk and subscribe to this video and this channel. Share it, like it, all the good things. And until next time, we'll see ya. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.